Are you ready for a thrilling journey through Judy Garland's life? She captured hearts and stirred up controversy. But what's the story behind her being called the Elvis of homosexuals? In this video, you'll uncover it all, from studio abuses to struggles with substances and tumultuous relationships. Her story is far from ordinary. Why was Judy Garland widely considered a homosexual icon? Maybe I should begin by asking who is Judy Garland and what you know about her life and time in the entertainment industry. She was a performer of the highest pedigree, but a deeply troubled talent all through her lifetime. How she became a huge figure for unconventional men is what has kept her name on the front burner in recent times. Born Frances Ethel Gum, Judy Garland achieved international fame as an actress in both musical and dramatic performances, as an exceptional recording artist and stage performer. Her uniqueness and versatility did not just give her a peculiar Academy, Golden Globe and Tony recognition. She was the first lady to grab the Grammy Award for the Album of the Year with her live soundtrack. From her undeniable sparkling breakthrough performance in The Wizard of Oz, to a later shines in A Star Is Born, Judy Garland made history like no other. However, and unfortunately too, her personal life was bedeviled with miserable stories that have made some describe her as a tragic actress. Her case is more of the not too palatable tale of her screen career, which she began with a dysfunctional parent. As if that was not enough, Judy found herself immersed in uncanny studio abuses that included early exposure to hard substances and alcohol. Her worst was eventually cemented with a series of unsuccessful and pitiable relationships and marriages. With all that crowding the life of this talented lady, it's no surprise that she had to throw in the towel at a very promising age of 47. Some say Judy was a victim of the horrific world of ancient Hollywood practice, but it seems her destiny was tied to whatever she had to go through because it became so difficult for her to break the cycle of wicked relationships that ended her in a financial mess. Interestingly, critics have theorised that this personal struggle and suffering may have contributed to her keen image as the much-adored queen among the community of queer men and those with opposing views. Little wonder why she commanded a large audience of this category of men in her shows and among her fan base. Was it all a coincidence that she married men who were later discovered to be queer? Of course, it's one too many for this great talent. The reason critics would continue to talk about her and her ties with this special community of men. Judy Garland was also aware that many of her fans were queer, with renowned media outlets labelling her the Elvis of homosexuals. How and why? I really could not tell. But noticeably, her popularity among queer men in America at the peak of her fame and her response as to how she felt about having a large number of such fans gives credence to the iconic image they thought she represented. Judy Garland said she couldn't care less about who was following her because she sings to the people. But before we delve into some of the reasons why this historic labelling has lingered and continued to resonate among leaders of thought, Let's look at how certain events unfolded. Judy Garland, from conception to her birth, almost appears like an unwanted child, considering that her over-ambitious vaudevillian mother made moves to abort her pregnancy, but fate prevailed following her doctor's opinion. Exasperated, Mrs. Gum Ethel would later monetize little Frances, Judy Garland, after she hurled her daughter on stage when she was just aged two plus, so she can perform alongside her two sisters. About two years after, the Gums moved to Lancaster, where Ethel hoped to get her daughters closer to the Los Angeles entertainment scene. Everything little Judy went through during this period is not unconnected to the reason she later described her mother as the real wicked witch of the West, whatever that means. It does not seem to be a good scorecard. Ethel's marriage with Judy Garland's father, Frank Gum, was not a happy one either. Interestingly, there have been rumours questioning the morality of Judy's father, with reports alleging that he may have been involved in bisexual activities, and particularly fingered for making some advances on teenage male ushers and students who visited the family's movie theatre. 
It does appear as if the ill repute of her father had forced the family to seek greener pastures in California. All that hunted little Judy as she later talked about her parents painfully separating on and off. Of course, I remember clearly the fear I had of those separations, she had said. Shortly after her father's demise, Judy was hired by MGM according to her mother's wish. At this time, the Gum sisters, as she and her sisters were professionally known, had changed their name to the Garland sisters, of which teenage Frances named herself Judy. Your famous Judy Garland was born. That first contract with MGM had a lot to do with Judy Garland's career miseries and stormy personal life. She became the newest sensation on display by the studio and was subsequently typecast in childlike roles, perhaps for her natural teen appearance. The studio began playing her alongside Mickey Rooney in many popular and rewarding films, and of course with more tasks at her disposal the demand for perfection was more important for the studio than anything else, as they did everything to retain her juvenile appearance for as long as possible. This process was both harsh and worrisome, as she was forced to regularly be on a diet. Did they say her chest was hurdled to retain those less developed outlooks? It was reported that Judy had an attendant who snatched plates of food from her and ensured she kept a diet of black coffee with up to 80 cigarettes daily. That was how terrible it was for her. While all that was ongoing, her selfish mother was okay with the financial benefits that accrued. As such, never bothered about the inherent emotional torture coming from the studio's abusive control of her daughter's natural look. It may not just be the derogatory remark by studio head Louis Mayer who labelled her my little hunchback or the occasional assaults of touching her offensively. Things were generally unbecoming for the young talent. You may be one of those still celebrating Judy for her wonderful performance in The Wizard of Oz. I'm not sure how you will feel to hear how 17 years old Judy smoked and took hard substances during the filming of that Technicolor fantasy movie. Although the movie gave her stardom, it came at a huge expense to young Judy, and all of that affected her mental state that even led to her exit from MGM Studios. Her early marriage was described as an attempt to free herself from the shackles of studio harassment and ridicule and liberate herself from her overbearing mother. Nineteen-year-old Judy thought marriage could solve her immediate problem, but unfortunately it did not. Rather more confusion was created when she married band leader David Rose, even against her mother and Louis Mayer's wishes. Painfully, even after becoming pregnant, Rose and others encouraged her to do away with the baby, only for the marriage to crash about eight months after coming together. It did not also end there, because critics linked whatever she suffered in her later life of heavy substance abuse, which continually overwhelmed her and eventually caused her death to all these. Judy Garland as a tragic figure is a term that has been overtly used in mainstream media to discuss not just her perilous career life, but her interesting popularity among the homosexual population. An analyst once talked about Judy's Palace Theatre rendezvous as a lopsided part that seems to be homosexual in trying to explain her appeal to queer men. I still recall reading a publication where an expert psychoanalyst reasoned that the attraction may have been considerably stronger because she survived several problems. Homosexuals identify with that kind of hysteria, the report said. It added that having been beaten black and blue by circumstances, Judy's life tilted more to masculinity, giving her a kind of aura that queer men admire, hence the attempt to identify with her. The first time I heard someone talk about Judy Garland as the Elvis of the queer community, I did not quite connect to that until I listened to a popular comedian give a comic insight into the tragic figure concept. Placing side by side Elvis as the king and Judy as the queen, in their different contest you will understand that both have a common drinking problem, but funnily Elvis gained weight while Judy lost weight. Elvis depended on painkillers but pills couldn't stop Judy's pain. After Judy Garland played the Dorothy Gale role in the 1939 Wizard of Oz, several ties between her and the unstraight community manifested even stronger, that up to this day many still wonder how the term Friend of Dorothy 
crept into the world of queer men and became a notable slang. Critics thought that the slang, which became a sort of secret code phrase among this category of men, was influenced by her depiction of Dorothy Gale in the movie. Dorothy's character made a trip from Kansas to Oz, that observers said exposed many unconventional men's longings to vacate the cultural limitations of small-town life for big colourful cities filled with quirky, gender-bending characters who would welcome them. As part of the storyline, Dorothy quickly welcomes peculiar personalities, even the Cowardly Lion, a camp presentation depicted by Bert Lahr. Through a song, the lion let the audience see him as a sissy, with those effeminate mannerisms. The thinking is that Lyon epitomises an oblique instance of Judy meeting and tolerating a queer man without any contemplation. Another epic event that analysts are commenting on as to how Judy gained her popularity as an icon in the Stonewall riots. Historians have tried to link Judy's burial date of the 27th of June 1969 and the Stonewall riots that took place barely 12 hours after. The following morning, an incident that is arguably the groundbreaking point of the present-day advocacy movement for unconventional gender practices. Several suggestions tend to believe that those who rioted were not regular Judy Garland show fans. They were persons who were not sure of where they were, going to sleep and where their next meal would come from. Although there were many of them who are regulars at the Stonewall Bar that particular night, and of course Judy Garland fans, who had earlier attended the very touching funeral of the star. They probably converged at the bar to drink as usual and to mourn their late friend, and as critics observed had been in high spirits over the loss, with feelings of anger in the air that made it almost certain that something cynical happened sooner. I read a report where one Sylvia Rivera, who fitted into this picture of Judy fans at the bar, noted that Judy Garland's death helped us hit the fan referring to the riot. Being that Stonewall Bar had no liquor licence, callers were required to register, and though many used aliases, Judy was one of the most famous patrons. For that reason, the truth about her and Stonewall riot ties is not the usual rumour, which is why it has persisted. More recently we have seen feature movies about these by Nigel Finch, depicting the events preceding the riots. Bostonia, the main character in the film, is seen watching Judy's funeral in grief on television and was later seen very emotional with Judy's song playing in the background. When police invaded the bar, Judy stays, he had shouted. In case you're lost somewhere about this, the Stonewall incident began like one of those regular police raids on homosexual bars, believed to be hot spots for drugs and illicit acts. It was just a coincidence that the particular action came on a day these gender-bending men were engulfed with rage and tense emotions. The incident began when a 17-year-old cross-dresser fought back to resist arrest by a cop who shoved her at the back of a waiting police vehicle. Reports say the victim had hit the cop and paid dearly with her life for that irrational action. Judy Garland is a huge advocate of human rights and would have approved the riot if what her daughter Lorna Luft said is anything to go by, something that Judy is regarded as the icon of queer men because of the popularity of her song Over the Rainbow. Recall that the rainbow flag had over the years become a symbol of this special community. Believers in this theory reason that she may have been inspired by the rainbow flag to do the song, which many say is more like the sound of the closet, inclining more to unconventional gender practices. This write-up will not be complete without a cursory look at Judy Garland's family relationships and marriages. Her father's alleged link to the unconventional world is one area that would come up any time, any day, but not until you hear how she fell in love with men who turned out to be the same kind of men. As I said earlier, Judy's father, Frank Gum, was fingered for seducing or trying to do so with younger men, and was said to have taken to his heel when he sensed that his activities were about to be discovered. I also heard that Judy Garland's second husband, Vincent Minelli, was alleged to have led a secret disoriented life. His closeted bisexual inclination came as a surprise to both Judy and some of her fans. The connection, or is it affliction, so to say, would continue, because I also heard that her fourth husband, Mark Heron, was in the practice with his confirmed age-long affair with a male performer, Henry Brandon, which observers say was briefly broken up when Judy got married to Heron. 
Did I hear you say too much of a coincidence? Of course, that's what it is. Not when she linked her daughter Lisa to her future husband, Australian vocalist Peter Allen, who turned out to be homosexual. Maybe if she was a man she would have been one, but she is not. Otherwise she would not have had so many ties with the queer men to the extent of being a regular caller at their bars and befriending known unconventional men like Charles Walters and George Cooker. But hold on tight, because we're about to delve into another electrifying tale. How Katie Gerardo delivered an orgasmic feeling to her audience. Watch this video now. <laughs> 